you to talk about folks who have, uh, who have been able to take um, uh, innovations and uh, create companies, uh, innovations from our university labs and federally funded programs and, and turn them into successful businesses here in the state of Montana. Um, we're going to hear directly from them about the challenges, and they have been many, and the opportunities that face them and their ability to grow their business and create jobs uh, in Montana. Uh, joining us here today, we're actually going to, we're going to reverse the order on you, which is just fine. Jerry Colstead, President and CFO of Rivertop Renewables in Missoula. We heard a little bit about this company a little bit early. Er, Pete Ruse, uh, CEO of uh, Bridger Photonics here in Bozeman. Good to have you here, Pete. Uh, Robert Hyatt, Program Manager with the Center for Advanced Mineral and Metallurgical Processing from Butte. Uh, interesting to hear his model. Uh, Craig Wilkins, uh, Executive Vice President from Zinc Air in Kalispell. And last but not least, Larry Hall, President and General Manager of SK Electronics out of Ronan. And so I think we'll just start with Jerry. And Jerry, you're welcome to start out. You can stand, sit, sure. whatever you want to do. Well, I asked him if I could uh, stand up. I'm uh, not much good at sitting down, and that's probably what part of it is about being an entrepreneur. I assume everybody can hear me. So I'm with Rivertop Renewables, I'm president and chief financial officer just because we don't have one. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Rivertop is, kind of talk through the process that got us here, and then I'll give uh, the senator one recommendation. So anyway, uh, maybe just a quick bit about me. I grew up in Glasgow, um, so uh, you know we take things pretty simple up there, but I'm a fifth generation Montanan. Uh, got into Deloitte Haskins and Sales, which is Deloitte and Touche now. Went out to Seattle and spent 25 years sort of trying to figure out this business, entrepreneur stuff. Uh, again, that Glasgow thing might have slowed me down a little. Um, they, uh, but the highlight, you know, you can't beat it. Uh, Amen, brother. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I uh, came back to Montana because some friends of mine uh, told me there's something going on at the University of Montana. you got to come and see it, Jerry. This is going to be big. And, you know, I, I say this all the time, but he actually did say this. I asked him, well, what is it? Because, you know, I hear this fairly often. He says, well, I don't know, but I know it's going to be big. <laughs> and so I came to the University of Montana and spent about four months just doing what I would call due diligence on this thing, just wandering around, talking to people and doing all this stuff. And, you know, I, I know you all want to teach professors how to be business guys. Boy, that's a tough thing because, you know, I've had to do it with Don Kiley, and then we're four years into it uh, Took me 25 years. It, it's a tough task, but we've got there. And so what we do in Rivertop is we're, we're addressing a really big problem out there. We're trying to get rid of you know, our dependence on petrochemicals um, and some of the really dangerous chemicals that are coming along with mining. You know, 8% of all oil and gas goes to make chemicals. It's a huge number out there. Um, the alternative, the thing that makes sense for Montana and the Midwest and all this stuff is to use corn or something else, another agricultural product like that. And so that's where we start. We're not a refiner of that, but we pick it up at the sugar point and take it from there. And what got invented at the University of Montana was this fantastic process for converting this stuff. And it's simple, it's fast, it's safe, it's all of those things. And you know, most yields on you take sugar and you're trying to turn it into chemicals, you might get 50, 60, 70 percent. We take 100 pounds of sugar and we get 144 pounds of product out of it. We have no waste or anything. We're grabbing weight out of oxygen and stuff like that. It, it is a very, very good process, the kind of thing that we should be working on in this country. Um, from that, what we get these chemicals and what we're launching two products right now, one goes into detergents. Uh, I imagine all of you have been looking at your dishes at home lately and finding that they're spotted and filmed and all of that stuff. And, that's because a little over a year ago, they took phosphate out of automatic dishwashers. We think we have an ingredient <coughs> or a formulation that actually can go take you back to that old level. And we're just going to introduce it next Friday in D.C., actually. Um, and, and we're very confident. We actually have a first customer already underway. Um, the other thing we're working on is corrosion inhibition, and we'll be announcing a pretty big order um, with the state of Montana here uh, probably in the next two weeks or so um, in the corrosion inhibition uh, market. And, we, we really do cool things there. This, this chemical of ours can reduce the amount of corrosion that happens, for instance, if you put down road salt, uh, brine in particular, the stuff that's liquid, um, significantly. And it works as well as anything out there. So we're, we've got these things coming along. Um, the company uh, today, we have 15 full-time people. Um, we're at least 3x average wage of Montana. Um, on, you know, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're looking to do the real high-end stuff. 
um, a lot of PhDs. We have four graduates of Montana State University, <coughs> which I'm proud to say I'm one of. We have eight graduates of uh, the University of Montana. Um, and we have uh, Utah and a couple others that we brought some people in. It's a nice mix of people. They're bright as can be and a great team. Um, we also use a lot of outside consultants. For instance, we have three Procter & Gamble people that are coming up and helping us. Uh, uh, we're exporting technology out of Cincinnati and bringing it right here to Montana. And one of them is the uh, former head of R&D at uh, Procter & Gamble. And, you know, we pay a pretty healthy price to get him up here. But it's the kind of things you've got to do if you want to go build a world-class company. And that's what we want to go do out there. So. But to get to this point, well, I should say one other thing. Uh, we're, uh, I talked to the VC this morning again. They've got the capital call out. And we're two weeks away from getting a seven-figure wire into our company. And that just doesn't happen <coughs> in Montana. In fact, I ask our accounting firm, Anderson's and Mellon, to go find me somebody. And they don't know anybody in the state right now that's being funded like this. And this is the start of a fairly big investment by this firm and a couple others that are coming. So we're, we have something sort of special going on right now in the capital formation area. Um, let me tell you all the story of how we got here, because we are a great example of how university-sponsored research makes it happen. Um, Don Kiley started 40 years ago. He's about to be an overnight success. Uh, working on this stuff, he just kept working and working and working. He came to the University of Montana 12 years ago and threw some grants from USDA uh, that totaled $2.4 million by the end. He managed to develop this process. And there is no way in the world a corporation would ever do this. Um, they don't take the time. They don't have the patience for this. And I mean, we're in a thousand or more experiments today on this. Uh, and it is safe, it's effective, and all those kind of things. Um, we also had all those PhD students who were out there doing work at the same time, and we kind of got, that's how we know where to go in the product area. It was exactly what was needed to get done. Um, at that point, the tech transfer office of the University of Montana stepped in. Uh, we're very good about helping uh, Dr. Kylie step out of the university. I came in at that point to help him get some business into the company, and, and we went out and done what we've had to go do. Um, you know, we've spent about three and a half million dollars already on this uh, private equity money. Um, Lots more is going to come. We'll probably be in 30 or 40 million before we're done on it. And it's a pretty exciting story. Um, but that 40 years, I just can't tell you how important that was. It was funded by the university system, especially these last 12 years. Um, you know, it, the thing I point out is, is two things about this. One is it's great that that money came in. The second thing is it came in consistently over that period. And I mean, that's the thing. You can't start to stop research. It, it's too damn hard. Uh, all the professors that are doing this kind of stuff and having to have apply for grants every year and stuff, you know, they need it. They need to keep going because they don't know when the market's going to hit. You know, renewable chemicals is what we do. It's a term you probably see them once in a while in the space these days. But, you know, it didn't show up until a couple years ago. Um, you couldn't have been funded in this area until a couple years ago. So you kind of have to have this research going on, and at the right time, we're on business guide. Not <coughs> so it, it is a really big thing. From there, you do need some supporting things, and there's a whole bunch of people in this room that have helped us out. Um, I, I really want to say something nice about the University of Montana, because they've been terrific. And I am an MSU graduate, so I understand what this is. <laughs> is for me. But uh, they have a quiet revolution going on over there. And President Engstrom is really doing good. Uh, I don't know if Joe Fundy is still here or not. but. He, he's sort of the on-the-ground guy that's doing this. And they've really sat down and figured out how to support companies. And, you know, our need was a facility. We needed lab space and stuff like that for chemical production. And labs that really were there, the kind of thing that could attract people to Montana. And the University of Montana and the Department of Commerce, EDA's uh, grant, uh, are putting it together, and they're going to build out the facility for us. And we'll pay it back through lease payments. We could never have got the money to do that. And without that, we're in Minneapolis or San Jose today. I mean, literally, that would be the case. So, um, you know, it, it's moving along now. There's that valley of death they talked about. I think anything you can do, I really applaud you for your, your bill. You're talking about capital formation. It's exactly what companies like ours need. We would go out and use that. But. So that, that's sort of the history of it and, and that it works. And I, I hope you all understand that historically it has worked. My one thing is what's going on today, Senator. It's... At government level, it's like we want to cut out all the money. And it's cutting your nose off to spite your face. I, I just don't understand why we would not see that this research we're talking about 
is what's going to be the product lines 10 to 20 years from now, the stuff that's going to set the world on fire again. You know, that's what the U.S. has always been about, Google, and all these things came out of research. And I, uh, I my mom was a teacher until she was 76 years old. Um, one of the great teachers up at Glasgow, she taught three generations of kids. And I got the chance to watch through her eyes how people develop if they have a great teacher and it really moves them along. And, and I, I so fundamentally believe in research and education and that that I just can't tell you. So my only thing is, is I tell you, just keep going. And if there's anything we can do, yeah. we're there to help you. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. I appreciate it. I appreciate you being in Montana, too, and not in Minneapolis or San Francisco, <laughs> somewhere else. Pete Ruse, uh, uh, CEO of Bridger Photonics. Pete? Thank you, Senator Tester. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'd like to, it, it's amazing the parallels that I, that I saw between your story and ours. Ours is obviously a little bit different, uh, but uh, we're, I'm a bobcat as well, so yeah, All right. I got that. All right. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll describe a little bit about our story very briefly, and then describe, uh, you know, pinpoint a few of the things that were critical in, in getting us there, and then those will drive my suggestions to you, Senator Tester, on, on what, what we could do in the future. And uh, there are only a few specifics I could go on forever, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll uh, put those in my written sure. testimony as well. Um, yeah, myself and, and two other MSU graduate students uh, in physics, uh, we, we moved away. We went down to Colorado. All of us in separate places went down to Colorado. We returned to Bozeman um, to raise families, really. We wanted to come back up. We loved Bozeman. We wanted to come back and raise families. Uh, I was at the university at the time uh, as a researcher, and we, we sat down one night and, and wrote three government proposals. That was the start of our company. We just sat down and wrote three proposals. No money, zero funding. Everyone always asks us, how much fund did you start with? Zero. Our answer is zero, nothing. So we wrote those three. We ended up hitting two of them. So, you know, we're pretty good writers, so that's good. We got that going for us. Um, we opened doors four years ago. Uh, it was myself, and one of the guys went back down to Colorado. He's sad now, but uh, at, the time, at the time, he had a really good opportunity, and we didn't have any funding yet. Uh, so uh, it was just two of us that started it. And let's see. Um, yeah, it basically opened the doors. I was working part-time uh, at, at the university still, and so was my partner. And uh, let's see, in the last four years, the company has grown to 18 employees and almost $3 million in annual revenues. That'll be this year. So we're pretty, pretty dang excited about that. Um, yeah, uh, we, we really focus on three core technologies now. Precision LADAR, and that's detecting using lasers to detect distance very precisely. Uh, we have the highest resolution LADAR system in the world, right here in Bozeman. We, I can tell you how far away the wall is, uh, better than a thousandth of the width of your hair. So really, really precise. And you might say, well, who cares about that? Well, yeah. it turns out people do. <laughs> you know, that, that, it may surprise you. But, but uh, you know, there's the automobile industry, aerospace industry, all these people want to know, down to a micron, do the pieces fit, right? It's amazing. It's a billion-dollar industry. You know, it's industrial metrology. Uh, we can also tell, we can also tell uh, for lower resolution stuff, we can, we can tell the military. We can help them identify stuff that's coming at them, and you can tell how important that would be. Um, our second core technology is precision LIDAR, and that's using lasers to detect gases remotely. And so we, the application there that, that gets the most press, it was one of many, is our ability, uh, we're, we're developing the capability to be able to detect the chemicals they use to make methamphetamine. And that's really kind of one of the impetus for the company. Turns out we come back up, we see all the press uh, with, with the, the, the negative press about methamphetamine, that we, we wanted to help solve that problem. Um, our third core technology is, is, is advanced imaging. And so we're able to not just measure a point, but uh, create 3D images uh, with the highest resolution and sensitivity of anyone in the world right now. So pretty cool stuff, high tech stuff that's going on. And I love it, I love it, you know, people, people will say, you know, uh, the same thing, I heard the comment, I think it was uh, uh, Joe Shaw, well, you're from Montana, well, you know, what's going on up there? And, you know, it's starting to get a reputation for, for some good things in Bozeman. And, you know, people say, well, can you do it in Montana? Can you, can you make this company succeed? Well, we have some evidence now. 80% of our technical workforce is, is our MSU graduates. And uh, we were just listed in the Inc. 500 just last month. Uh, we were in, made the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies in the United States. We were number one in the engineering sector. 
right here in Montana, fastest growing engineering company in the US. Pretty, pretty excited, and we're Montanans, 80% Montanans, right out of MSU. Can it happen? Absolutely, it can happen, we can do it. Okay, so um, let's see, I, I want to, I like to, uh, and people that have heard me speak before uh, will know this, but um, I really like to, when you, when you start a company, you have to focus on, on what you do really well, our core, core competencies, our, our core capabilities. And I like to broaden that to a country scope. And so, okay, what, what's our, what, what are people's countries, what are their core capabilities? Well, you look at Germany, okay, German engineering. Everyone knows that the Germans know how to engineer. That's what they do really well. Uh, the, the Japanese know how to manufacture. They have their manufacturing processes down better than anyone. If you want manufacturing, that's where you go. Okay, the Switzerland, they know time. Everyone has their, <laughs> that's right, they, they have precise time. <laughs> they know how to keep time. Uh, so, uh, what's ours in the United States? And this is obviously uh, pervading the discussion prior to, to right now, but it's innovation. That's what we do. That's what the United States does. Innovation. It's, it's in our heart, it's in our soul, it's in our, it's in our economic system, it's everywhere. That's what we do. And so, I guess, uh, you know, from, it's from the internet, the, the first laser in here, the first transistor, everything. You look at us, we innovate. We, we need to keep that. And so uh, my general comment is, when you look at poly policy decisions, always have that in the back of your mind. How can I make a decision that is gonna improve our core competency? Innovation, how can I make it? I don't care whether it's, it's a, a tax or a, a, a subsidy and, and, and a, a spending subsidy, I don't care. Think in your mind, is this gonna help innovation? Okay, uh, that's my, you, but that's my thing on, on innovation. Uh, it's, it's incredibly important for our country. Um, okay, now what are the things from that history of what we did, what are the things that I would recommend specifically that, that we do? Well, we started on SBIR grants and contracts. And I know I'm, this is going to uh, mirror some of the, some of the uh, comments before, but some specific things that I would recommend. Number one, implement a white paper stage to the, F, uh, to the federal SBIR proposal process. Uh, our proposals are about 25 pages long, and that takes a significant amount of time, not only to write, but surely to, to evaluate as well. It's very simple. Cut it down to five pages and let them, let them cut through. You know, they, they must get 40 of these for each of the topics. Cut it down to five, and then have, a, have those five write a full proposal. It, it seems to me really logical. I don't think it would be too hard to implement, but you know how things go. Um, uh, alongside of that, um, I, I would appreciate, uh, our, and our small businesses going for SBR funding would appreciate a standardized uh, interface for submitting grants and, and uh, uh, contracts. I mean, they, I think they kind of tried to do this with grants.gov. I, I don't consider it a success at all, so you guys can comment on that as well. But I personally, I, I like NSFs. I can give you some, some hint, hints on that, I, I, and you maybe ask some other people, but I like NSFs interface, very simple, very easy, effective. Just make it the same across the board for every one of the agencies. So I don't have to go in and figure out how to submit one of these things. It takes me a long time to do it. It's just, it's not efficient. Um, Okay, the, the, the third thing is, uh, this goes back to the patent issue, and this is, I'm so glad everyone else has been talking about this. We are facing this right now. Someone asked, well, how much do patents cost? Well, the one we're trying to, to nail down right now, they broke into six patents international, it's gonna cost over a million dollars. That's too much for us to pay. <coughs> so what's gonna happen, and again, this goes back to, you know, what do we do to support innovation? We're gonna, we're gonna give up some of those things. And that's sad because, because that's, that's the core of innovation, right? Wrapping that up. And so we're gonna have to give up some of those things. So my suggestion, and I know uh, in the tight budget days it's really hard, but some way to subsidize small business and university patents. So, so figure out, it's still gotta be painful for, for the university, it's gotta be painful for the small business, but it has to be also doable. So, uh, so those things. And you could have a payback to the, to the government. I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, as you start rolling in the, the cash uh, to, to, to bring in the revenues from that, pay back the, the country. That's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, uh, let's see. And uh, more general, we're, we're going to apply for a, a $3 million contract coming up 
that would be huge for us to, to put one of our imagers on, on, on choppers. They're bringing the choppers in, they can't see because of the, all the sand and dust that gets kicked up, and our imagers can penetrate that. Well, we're at a disadvantage because we're going up against the Lockheed Martins, we're going up against the Northrop Grumman's, and I, this is more of a general comment. If we can get some, some all, all I ask is an even fair and playing field. Yeah. If you give us that, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do really, really well. So anyway, we'll, we will compete with them every day, and we're gonna win. Yeah. So, so I want an even playing field. I don't know how to do that, so I can't say something specific there. But any help w we can come up with on that. Uh, the last thing is uh, the model we had. Uh, what enabled us similarly was the university, and and a couple things there. We had this thing. Uh, this is the Montana State University Spectrum Lab. And it, I don't know if its intent was that, but we came in and, and I, was a, I was, you know, raring to go, ready to, to try new things. And they allowed, it was a launch pad for us. They, they provided uh, flexible employment. I could work for the university and still start the business. That was critical for us because uh, it mitigated our risk and that we, uh, that we had this availability of space. We could rent space from them and we, we had the availability of equipment. The, all those things are so important. And then, of course, the constant flow of really high, highly qualified employees is critical for our growth. So thank you again. Yeah, yeah thank you, Pete. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about some of this stuff here in a bit. Um, Robert Hyatt, Program Manager of the Center uh, for Advanced Mineral and Metallurgical Processing. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tester. Um, since I do work for Montana Tech, I have to throw a caveat out that not all <laughs> these opinions are of camps. Montana Tech or the Montana University system, don't know how far down the list we'll get, but my testimony is definitely loaded. <laughs> you know, you, you touched on patents here, and I'm going to start there. The interesting thing is if you look at the revenues generated by universities from their selling their royalties and that, minuscule. It, in most cases, it doesn't pay for the technology office to even exist. So how can we do something? Like I, I was told Rice University does this. They don't necessarily charge for their patents. They grant royalty-free uh, grant uh, royalty -free licenses out to companies, something along those lines. Why can't we do something like that, where if you place your manufacturing facility in Montana, you don't have to pay royalties. Let's get creative with something like that. And again, I think helping fund those patents. A few years ago, I was in Washington, D.C., talking to a top uh, patent firm. And we asked him, how are we going to get this stuff patented? And what's it going to cost us? He says, we'll plan on one to five million for the international patents, 50 million for your first litigation. Mm. So there's another thing, tort reform related to patents and helping the small company defend. Uh, because you brought this up, uh, the innovative model, CAMP is, a, is an interesting center. Uh, our, my paycheck comes from the state of Montana, but the state of Montana doesn't directly contribute to the pay. We are all soft money. The minute we don't have grant money in the kitty, I got a 15-day notice on my job. So we're hungry to win grants. We're hungry to do innovation. So part of our model is we actually do testing and research for for-profit companies. Uh, we analyze everything from minerals and metals. We help uh, mining companies improve their extractive processes. We've recently uh, worked for a company out of Alabama who had been uh, awarded uh, an earmark and uh, did all their testing on a next generation Hellfire missile system rail in our little old lab in Montana Tech. So uh, we see uh, a lot of the government funding uh, uh, directed initiatives drying up for a few years here and we were concerned that a lot of our funding comes from that area. And, You've done great things to help our, our group uh, continue doing research at Montana Tech. So we have actually created a business, several of us created a business uh, with the approval of the university outside for profit. And what we are doing is going after engineering contracts as a group of individuals so that we can slide the research, the applied research portion back in the university. Uh, we uh, got the paperwork off the ground about seven months ago. And uh, I'm in the process right now. I'll be working all night tonight on our first big proposal for DuPont, next generation uh, technology they want to get into the uh, gas drilling industry. Could be big. Uh, we're pulling in the petroleum engineering department. We've got CAMP. We've got the metallurgical engineering group. So it's a neat way to do it. And uh, that company sits right here in Montana. 
we have proposals out to a Sand Hill Road Series A funded uh, venture firm right now for basically creating a uh, e-waste uh, remediation technology. Funny thing is, if you're in California, you can get venture funding. This idea has been done all over the world. These folks somehow got funding, so we're at least trying to, to design the process for them, even though it's been done before. Mm -hmm. So money's out there. Um, our same group of guys also have another for-profit venture that we're trying to bring money back in uh, to Montana. Hoping to hear within the next hours whether we had a, uh, a foundation has basically given us the nod on a half a million dollar grant to do uh, water remedi remediation technology for uh, hydraulic track fluid. So it's a bad word back east and they have a big problem with it. We uh, have a technology where they're engineering firm to uh, create the solution. Best part is we're bringing all the research back to Butte. We're going to do it in Butte and then export everything out. Now the bummer is, and one of the points I'd like to see in terms of policy, we've heard MBRCT brought up several times. That program was gutted. It, it's, it's horrible to see. Uh, I think uh, Evan Barrett brought up a great point. We can take a million dollars and make it look like a billion, but it still costs me a lot of money to do my research. A million dollars is still a million dollars. Um, we, uh, we weren't fortunate enough to get funded this year. If I had gotten a $100,000 grant, we had requested uh, the company that I'm doing consulting for said I could set up their manufacturing here in Montana. The bummers, I'm setting it up in Pittsburgh for them now. So it's too bad. That was a small operation, probably 80 people in Butte doing manufacturing. So MBRCT is a great ticket. And uh, you know something that could be added to that program as well is to add a formal review process where we bring in what we call professional money. The VCs, the angels, and that to look at technologies. Uh, there was a technology developed out of the Silicon Valley in software. And uh, the guys came to VC asking for their Series A funding, $300,000. VC said, no, I'm not going to fund that technology. But this delivery system you have is neat. We'll give you funding. And they argued and argued. Finally, the VC said, you're not getting the money unless you work on this. Two years later, that became hot mail and sold for half a billion dollars. So the VC has the eyes of the market and the value of technologies. It can often help small companies redirect their efforts. So tying that in, um, SBIR, that is hot. Um, we were actually contracted by this Pennsylvania company to apply for an SBIR. We just won them one. Best part is in bringing all the research back to view. So it's a lot of fun there. But one thing we find, as I'm sure you've noticed, a micro small business, 15 people or less, has to compete with a 500 person small business. They can afford professional tech writers, marketing people, graphic arts people. We're just trying to get enough time in the day to meet payroll and type up that 25 page proposal. Uh, it typically takes, for a good proposal, 120 to 160 hours of effort. And that's if you already have your technology dialed in and know where you're going. So having that white paper, great idea, but also taking a part of that set aside and resetting it aside for micro businesses, because that's where the innovation is happening, is in the micro businesses. I also think the SBIR process needs to be limited. I think we need to cap the number of SBIRs that can go to one company, personally. I've seen SBIR uh, mills win hundreds of these things. And I'm thinking, if you can win a hundred and can't get two or three technologies to pop, you're not qualified to be getting more federal funding. Use these, create the innovation, grow your company, stay focused. And that way, the rest of us that are competing against these top-notch technical writing companies have a shot at winning these grants. You'll see through my dialogue, I'm quite plain in my English. I, uh, I'm not a great writer. We get it down and we try to get it done, but it's hard to compete with these uh, professional writers. Uh, the other thing, too, uh, coming from Butte, uh, Montana Tech is at a disadvantage when we go after federal funding on, on uh, competitive grants because we don't have a fully funded PhD program. That's needed. You see Bozeman. We're booming here in Bozeman. Things are growing great. We've got PhDs coming out. We've got graduate students coming out. And Montana Tech is struggling. If we compare them to a place like Michigan Tech, old mining school started about the same time. Michigan Tech now brings in over $60 million a year in grants half a million dollars in revenue a year off their technology. Montana Tech is at about nine. And I think we made $2,000 in royalties last year. 
we need to do something to really get that program funded, and we can't raid the MBRCT to do it like the state did. The other thing, too, in our rural schools, we have a lot of wonderful rural schools, but we need to improve the K-12 through education in, in cities like Butte. Science has to be important. Music has to be important. All these broad areas that, that broaden the minds of our young scientists. And I even think, why not entrepreneurial classes right in the high schools? Let kids dream early. Let them learn those skills. I'm brought into a ton of startups because everyone thinks I know how to run businesses. Well, I'm good at running pieces of them. I'm good at pulling people together and that sort of thing. Uh, but you, people need to learn skills. I don't know how many PhDs I work with, and they have no idea how to write a check in their checkbook, let alone run a company. Phenomenal research, world class. So those skills need to be taught. Recently brought my kid's fourth grade math workbook back to Pennsylvania and was showing a teacher, oh, that's a good author. We use a book very similar to it in our second grade classes. So Butte's a little behind. And I'm sure some of the other rural cities around Montana may be too. All of our kids should have a shot at being competitive to get into the MITs, the Stanfords, the MSUs. We need that. University of Michigan. My dad was a bobcat. <laughs> And the other thing we can't forget is you see these huge numbers. Um, Montana State is getting $100 million in grants and only $260,000, $400,000, whatever is coming back in the licensing fees. What we forget is a lot of the graduates coming out of our great universities here are creating these businesses as we had a previous speaker talk. And they're coming back to the state. They're creating the businesses. They're creating payroll, payroll taxes, business taxes, we are being paid back. The university may not be getting the money, but the state of Montana is. And we can't forget that. We don't need to see a direct correlation between the number of patents, the number of dollars of royalties, all that, as long as we're keeping those businesses here in the state. So we need to keep funding these, even though the numbers look very high. Somebody else mentioned this too, flights in and out of the state. I'm now on planes uh, 46 hours a month. And I fly through Salt Lake City a whole heck of a lot, drop into Atlanta, up into Pittsburgh. I'm all over the place. And I thank you and your staff for not stopping that flight that was supposed to end on October 1st out of Butte. It's, it's really a hassle. Um, we need standard, standardized service so the rates don't fluctuate between $500 and $1,000 with advance warning, that sort of thing. So we got to keep on that. It's hard to attract businesses in when you can't get people in, you can't get investment in. Uh, when I was sitting with DuPont working on part of the contract, one of the 50 minutes in the conversation, the first thing he says, can you come work for me in Wilmington? Bring your team here and do the work in Wilmington. I said, no, we're doing it in Butte. You know, so they asked that because it's too hard to get into Montana. So right. if we can at least make air travel easier, uh, I think we got a better shot. Right. And the uh, last point I want to make here is, well, two more points. Directed funding. The uh, earmarks have gone away. But I would like to see a way that we could potentially, in rural states, take a lump of money that's essentially given to maybe the congressional staffs to dole out like we used to do with directed initiatives to worthy projects and get the money out there like those the old programs were, but for R&D and commercialization and have a, a re required breakdown. Why not? 25% going to basic research at the universities and research centers. 25% to the University and Research Center for applied research with the caveat they have to bring in a small business as a partner. Give them, again, preferred IP licensing rights too for that effort. 25% to micro small businesses. 15% to small business, 10% for everybody else. And then let's limit the number of earmarks, appropriations, directed funding a single company can get. Again, why should you be winning those serially over and over again? especially if they're for research and commercialization technology. Let's, uh, that would be a nice way to, uh, to direct that. And the, and the last point I wanted to make is organizations like CAMP are important to the state. We're again funded on soft money, and we could be gone next year. We have about a year's worth of funding in the kitty. We're writing grant requests like crazy all over the U.S. It would sure be nice if there was actually directed funding to fund those centers. Uh, CAMP was uh, formed almost 15 years ago by a small grant from the state of Montana. We were the only center that survived out of the 14 originally founded. And we've been surviving, we've been thriving, we're recreating our model all the time. People are asking us to do work continuously, but it's hard to hold 
uh, seven full-time researchers, uh, administrative staff. At our peak, we had um, 14 professors working for us, 28 students, uh, and we're, we're just generating a lot of really great uh, work for uh, third-party companies who, again, were coming back to Montana to get this analysis done, and we we're training students that are going out in the world on world-class equipment that usually you don't touch unless you're a PhD student, so it's quite exciting. So, thank you. Well, yep, yeah, thank you, Robert. I appreciate appreciate your comments. Craig Wilkins, Executive Vice President for Zinc Air, Good. up in California. And I've got ADD, so I I need to stand up and walk around. Pete right. fired me up, so I I, I got to feel like I got to move. Um, just to give people a little bit of background, Zinc Air, uh, we're a grid scale storage battery, uh, not your mom's batteries or your grandfather's batteries, but essentially batteries that are the size of this room. Some of the projects that we've talked about, SBIR, SDTR, John and I've talked a long time. But our batteries are $4 million a piece, and each individual component is very expensive. Um, we spent about $500,000 as founders and owners just to start getting an understanding of the research of is this a good technology or not. When we decided to go to the next step and, and we built the prototype, we went to a company called Semi-Tool based out of Kalispell because our system, our battery is an electrochemical plating system, and just so happened that Semi-Tool is a leading innovator on plating copper, we just plate zinc. So there was, there was a lot of synergies that brought us to Montana outside of the fact that I'm from Helena, I'm a fifth generation Montana. There's a lot of reasons why we want to be in, in Montana, but quite frankly, if Semi-Tool wasn't in Montana, we'd be in Silicon Valley. So as much as there's a lot of things out there, there are certain industries that are conducive to Montana, um, but blessed Ray Thompson, he, he put his neck on the on the line, brought his company up to Kalispell, and now we're leveraging his entire infrastructure. It, it's, it sounds like a lot of money, but over the, we've raised now $5 million privately. I would guarantee if Semi-Tool wasn't there, we would have spent an additional $5 million just to try to think and maintain that we're in Montana. So let's leverage what, what we have. If you got right now technologies down the door, and you want to start trying to figure out how to leverage, leverage the business that's already here. Ray Thompson did a, did a great job of creating jobs, but he was very vertically integrated. Our goal for Zinc Air is, can I be the hub of the mall? Are people coming to us because we're building this electrochemical plating system? But guess what? I need inverters. Guess what? I need control systems. Guess what? I need tanks to put my electrolyte in. I need chemistry background. I need this level of experience to make sure that my company's successful. And I don't want to, I'll tell you, my job is be asset light. I'm not going to go off and try to create something that someone else already does well. If not, I hope to lure those companies to Kalispell so we create a valley of, of expertise within the electrochemical system business, how do you put it? I will tell you, the Silicon Valley didn't happen by accident. There was a very concerted effort between public, private, and university collaboration that says, this is the arrow, this is our focus, and this is the direction we're going to go. And get on the train or get out of the way. The beautiful thing is once you're really good at something, there's a lot of spin-off businesses that take you out other direction. Montana has yet to figure out what we're really good at. Right now, I'll tell you, we're really good at electrochemistry because I, still to this day, semi-tool and applied materials are leaders. I'll tell you what, we're very good at uh, software and innovative systems. Right now, technology's got a thousand employees. Leverage these guys. I hope to be the guys that you guys leverage. I hope you talk about me because we've been successful and we've spun out our businesses. But we, 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 Montana, because we're so scattered geographically, politically, whatever it is, it's hard to get everyone into a room and say, come on, let's start working together and making some things happen. So uh, a couple different things that I really want to push up. I, I, when I first came in, uh, the first people I met with were Lee Spangler and Nick Zelver back here to try to figure out how do I do sponsored research in Bozeman or Missoula. Bozeman made common sense of where, what we were doing or Butte. I sat down, hadn't signed an NDA, but sat down and I said, this is what I want. I want this, this, this. I want to do testing. This is my game plan. And at the end of the day, I need to own the IP. And they said, well, we can't do this. And I said, well, how about this solution? If I'm paying you to do research, and we have one of those aha or oh sugar moments, which actually creates innovation. If I paid you to do that research, I should get, I should get that intellectual property. 
under our current rules right now, that's not the case. The IP is owned by the university and then I get a royalty. Problem number two is, when I go to say, okay, well, what's that royalty going to be? They can't calculate because that's a negotiated item after the fact. So if it's hugely impressive to me, I go, oh, great. And then you go, well, it's an 8% royalty off of, off of gross sales. I go, oh, boy. That, that, it, it doesn't make sense. So as much as we're talking about, if a company comes in and I take their research, this, if I took your research but I started manufacturing in Montana, I, get to, I don't have to pay a royalty? I like that idea. Better yet, if I'm paying you to do the research, I should be able to keep that, that IP. Plain and simple. It's not me saying it, it's your venture capital community that's going to tell you that. It's any one of your individual large net worth investors that said, you did what? So, the net net effect was I spent $300,000 in sponsored research at two different universities. One was real simple. You know, a zero royalty licensing arrangement. Okay, cool, I'm, I'm okay with that. We'll work with that. The other one, I had to do some tweaky things to do because I wanted to secure the, the professor who helped us finalize our patent on our chemistry, which I knew was critically important. But I spent that 300000 went out of the state, and more importantly, the two grad students that worked on that project are going to come back and work for us in the spring when they graduate. And that's somewhat of a shame, and it's not that it's something I feel good about, but I want to be able to work with the university system to expand. And I know 300000 doesn't seem like a lot, but it's more about the leverage off of that 300000 that's important. So, absolutely fired up. This has been my soapbox item. I've talked to Pam about it. I've talked to everyone about it. If there's a way that if a company's willing to put his capital at risk, I would not give a consultant the IP if I engaged them. I don't give my employees the IP if I pay them. I wouldn't expect to go to the university and if I gave them money to then own the IP that I paid for. And I understand by Dole and, and there's assets that were purchased with public funds. Then give me a fully loaded burden cost on your, on your fees. I'll pay it, but let me stay within the university system and expand the young minds that we hope to hire and will hire moving forward. That's simple. <laughs> but by the way, I'll just, just a quick, so I got some good news for John. Um, about two months ago, we secured our first customer, a local wind developer. Every one of our batteries, once again, is $4 million, so each one sounds really good. Uh, we also asked the senator here for help. Uh, I think we're going to finalize a letter of intent. It's mm -hmm. not done yet, but for $40 million, wow. an early stage company. We finalized a purchase order with our first commercial customer for a $250,000 first beta test unit that they're looking for about 25 of them. That's great. So we're making some headway. That's great. But the big ones because of the big guy sitting right here. <laughs> he helped us pull it together. So I want to thank him. So thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Larry Hall, President, General Manager of SK Electronics. Well, thank you, Senator. <clears throat> I, I don't have ADA, so I think I'll, I'll sit here. <laughs> Is that American Disability Act? Or <laughs> <laughs> The issue is, I think I'm the oldest business here on this table, and uh, and it's not even my business. It's the tribe's business. SK Electronics started back in '84 uh, by the Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribes. What we were trying to do is bring jobs to the reservation, uh, but not just any kind of jobs. We wanted to have technology jobs. We wanted to have something that we could generate oh, I'm not sounding loud enough jeez <laughs> I've never had that complaint uh, so in 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 our history of trying to start SK electronics we we felt that uh, we didn't have IP we did not have the technology of a product so we went the other way we went into contract manufacturing we were going to build other people's product for them. Uh, initially, that was going to be government product. Uh, we did a, a several years' worth of bidding and, and trying to develop that side. Uh, we did do one early, early project that kind of is our, our bread and butter. Uh, it was an, uh, generated our first IP with the company, and it's called an M1 or M3 heater. 
and as part of the air filtration system for all, all armored vehicles. But with that IP, we, we are now the sole builder of this particular product uh, nationwide, worldwide actually. Uh, nobody else can, has built this particular item. Uh, if they wanted to invest enough dollars, they could, but uh, it's, it's something that we now own and it's, and it's ours. So from the early state, even though we were a contract manufacturer, we knew that we wanted to do IP. We knew that we needed to have product that we could call our own. But how do you do it when you're, you know, you don't have both the, the, the human capital in the company, we don't have professors, we don't have PhDs and such, we do have engineers in our company, uh, but that, that created a, a capability question with small companies. And this is something that as a model for Montana companies, you know, you, you have to address somewhere. Uh, but anyway, we, we were able to secure some contracts with uh, NASA uh, that allowed us to get some very, very top-notch uh, scientists. Uh, they were located down in Houston, which, you know, yeah, you, you make do with what you can. And we were able to leverage that, that brain power, that human capital, and, and to bring other things to our company back here in Montana. So we started there. Uh, we, you know, as contracts developed and other things, we got into SBIR. Uh, we were fairly successful. We got four SBIR phase twos, or phase ones, and three phase twos, if I remember right. Uh, now that IP is, you know, wavering. It's, it's not the greatest IP, but, you know, it's there, and we, we do some, some development of that. The, but, but one of the things it did do, even though we might not have a product that's selling right now, it gave us capability, and then that reaches into capacity, which <coughs> then that means now we can do other things in design work that, you know, over the 20 plus years that we've been in business, a small company in Montana can grow uh, organically the capability to do major stuff. Now we have, you know, we're competing on contracts with all the big guys. Uh, and, and one of the things that's interesting, they're now coming to us because we have the best price point in design engineering. You know, they, they can't do it in-house for what we can do it. So now we're starting to win contract work. And then the next phase is we find collaboration with other companies. Uh, one, of course, uh, Alex is in the background, I'm back there. Uh, we, Alex and I met in a project that we were, two different companies working on the same project was Helena Airport. And we started talking. And he needed manufacturing, you know, the, the nuts and bolts stuff. And I needed ideas. And so we started talking. Uh, this is where TechLink comes into play. They had some technology that was uh, coming out of the, the naval labs over in uh, uh, Newport, Rhode Island. So all of a sudden, we're now talking about licensing technology out of a federal lab that jointly, because we're the business side of it, the manufacturing, we are, we are joint licensing this technology. With our engineering capability, we had to actually reverse engineer everything the Navy did because they, they were really poor in documentation and such. But uh, all of a sudden, you know, now we're rolling, we're what, five years now, Alex? Something like that. We have product. Now we're in the valley of death, actually. You know, we, we need to both find some additional capital to, to bring it to the next level, but it can be done. The, the bottom line is it can be done. You've got to collaborate. You've got to extend out where you can. You know, it's, you've got to risk capital. You've got to risk business. You know, if you're going to have any type of return, you've got to risk. And so as an entrepreneur or, or a, sci you know, a research scientist, maybe not necessarily know how to risk. And if you're in business, farming or whatever, 
you're risking every day because you never know what the weather's going to be. And that's the same with art. You know, we deal with people. People have daily problems. But again, it's, you've got to look at the long term and, and balance, keep things in balance, but then do the risks, calculated risks, and go for it. Uh, so I do have a couple of things, but they've already been mentioned in the way of policy changes. There is the issue of, of licensing cost, you know, for transfer. You know, we, we did some transferring of some of the technology from the university systems, both MSU and uh, U of M. Their, their need for upfront money is the one thing that small companies don't have a lot of. So either, either waiving it or back-end loading it, you know, have it paid at the other end of it once the product comes about. And I think those, those ideas have already been mentioned. So, um, and, you know, it's, it's definitely the SBIR program. Um, you know, I, the, the issue of venture capitalists, can they be part of it? You know, the, that whole thing, I think it, the, the issue is there's got to be an SBIR program. If there's, if there's a need to break it down into micro business size and, and such, maybe that's a way to get around the, you know, the venture capital people wanting to have access to the 500, you know, size companies. Uh, I do agree with, if they're just a mill, they can't be using the program just to crank, keep people employed, because that's really not transferring the technology and getting it out. Uh, somehow that has to change. But um, we're behind time. Go ahead. Well, thanks, Larry. I, I appreciate it. Um, we are a little behind. But uh, 